Hello, I'm Colin Kaiser, and I am a partner with the law firm of Saxon and Stump in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I'm also the chair of the senior care services practice at the firm. Uh, today we're going to be presenting on the best practices upon admission uh, to your personal care home or assisted living residence for managing risk and reducing liability later on. Today's presentation is going to go over some of the liability trends that we're now seeing more and more in the personal care and assisted living setting. We're going to discuss how to develop risk mitigation evidence on admission uh, that you can potentially use later uh, and implement to reduce any potential claims uh, that occur in the personal care or assisted living setting. Uh, I'll be presenting today with one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Kevin Moser, and I'll let Dr. Moser introduce himself. Hello, uh, I'm Kevin Moser. I'm a uh, retired, um, recently retired CEO of Wellspan Health. Uh, and I'm a family physician who uh, was in practice for more than 40 years in both uh, medical practice and in healthcare administration. Uh, a great part of the concentration of my practice years was in uh, skilled nursing facilities and the management of geriatric uh, patients, having earned the uh, uh, certificate of added qualifications in geriatrics uh, during my uh, training. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to uh, talk with Colin a little bit about uh, how we can reduce our risk of litigation in, uh, in your facilities. So as Dr. Moser said, uh, he and I work uh, closely on evaluating cases that pertain to various types of medical malpractice in the acute care setting but we specifically work quite a lot. Uh, just to give you some context about our firm, we are 60 plus lawyers and paralegals. <clears throat> We're a full service firm, but historically our roots are in defending medical providers. And that includes hospitals, physicians, mid-levels, and various types of senior care and long-term care facilities. Um, what I wanna start out today with is kind of taking you through kind of where we are uh, on, on, in, in terms of senior care litigation from the plaintiff's perspective. This has become an area where the plaintiff's bar uh, has become more aggressive, they've grown, and we're seeing more and more plaintiff's firms that are becoming interested in senior care litigation. Uh, the plaintiff's bar that is pursuing these types of senior care cases, they are well resourced, organized and often very politically correct, uh, connected. They are trying to actually change the venue laws in Pennsylvania uh, to try to get these types of cases out of the central Pennsylvania and surrounding counties and get them into the, some of the metropolitan areas like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And they haven't been successful yet, but they have invested quite a lot of time and money in, in being able to do that because they know historically that they have been able to do much better in terms of getting larger settlements and verdicts in those counties. Um, it's also a very big business. Uh, there are lots of firms out there that just will take in cases and they don't do the work. They actually refer it out to a different firm to do the work, but they get a fee in return for just that referral without having to do anything. Uh, they can get up to one third of any potential recovery. And so this is a, this is a big business among lots of different types of firms uh, that, that really want to get into this area because historically, unfortunately, a lot of these senior care cases eventually settle. Very few go to trial. Now, today's presentation is really not about COVID-19, uh, but I needed to make a few comments about some of the trends that we're seeing that are going to impact personal care and assisted living and your skilled nursing facility as well. Um, the, the problem that has been set up now in Pennsylvania is that Governor Wolf's uh, immunity order was really limited and, and truly did very little, if anything, to protect uh, senior care facilities uh, where there's often, in the allegations against these facilities, uh, the focus is the corporate negligence. And, and the immunity order that was passed really did nothing for the corporate entities. We're also seeing, obviously, mandatory COVID testing, and so 
even facilities that maybe didn't have any positive cases now with the mandatory testing are showing some either among their residents or staff. Uh, we know in terms of the percentages, 68% uh, of the deaths that we've seen in Pennsylvania uh, from COVID-19 are occurring in personal care and nursing homes. And the plaintiff's bar is aware of this. It, it has gotten their attention. Um, and what we're seeing are very well-resourced, sophisticated plaintiff's firms that are out there soliciting cases, they're sending litigation hold letters, and in some cases are actually already filing cases against rehab, uh, long-term care, and senior care facilities. What's really been interesting about it is that the firms that are pursuing this, some of which never pursued senior care or long-term care cases before, but what they see is a new opportunity with COVID-19 to get into this space and it's often the firms that are more sophisticated and better resourced because these, these cases are going to be complex and take those types of firms that have those resources to really get them across the finish line. And so firms that we didn't see before that we would see maybe in just acute care hospital cases are now getting into that space. Um, the, the key to defending these claims is going to be your documentation. You know, were you keeping contemporaneous documentation of the steps that your facility was taking to follow local, state, and federal guidance uh, with respect to limiting transmission of COVID-19 and responding to positive cases. Uh, that's really what's going to be key, that you have that right documentation in place. And in instances where you were unable to comply, is there documentation of the mitigating circumstances as to why you couldn't. Um, if you don't have that documentation in place, the liability is continuing. We're not obviously through the pandemic. Uh, there's still opportunity and it's better to get that in place now before a potential claim is filed. So if you haven't looked through that, those documents to make sure you feel like you've got everything well documented, then I would recommend that your facility start working on that. Okay. Whether it's, whether it's a COVID-19 case or your general kind of fall case or uh, pressure wound type case, um, the truth is those cases are all premised on the fact that this is a challenging population, uh, largely because they, they do come in with multiple comorbidities, they're often fragile or acutely ill, or they're just getting to the natural end of life. And so that causes a challenge in the population medically that you don't have in other types of medical malpractice cases and which are also often up against is either you know a family that might feel guilt about the fact that mom and dad are now in the facility uh, or just a unwillingness to accept the reality that that mom or dad are getting towards end of life and and the comorbidities that come with that and so almost always these cases are brought by adult children. Um, once in a while you see something by maybe a spouse who's a little younger or at least surviving, but, but more often than not it's the adult children who bring these types of uh, senior care cases. So I'm going to ask Dr. Moser to talk about uh, this population more from a medical perspective. All right, thanks Colin. So this is a very difficult population to manage and uh, uh, goals of care and uh, methods of caring for them are very different than pretty much any other population that we manage uh, as physicians. And while uh, many of us in, in this room would understand that, um, it's not always clear to either jurors or to uh, plaintiff's attorneys going forward. So some things that are very, very important is, is uh, medication management. Uh, patients as you get older have uh, differing metabolism of uh, medications. Uh, they are sensitive at different levels to medications. It takes often less of a certain medication to receive, to receive a therapeutic benefit and therefore less to uh, become toxic. In addition, once a, uh, an individual gets over three medications and concurrently, uh, with every added medication, the risk of uh, interactions between those medications goes up. 
and therefore it becomes very difficult to begin to ascertain whether uh, it is the medication itself or an interaction or side effect of that medication. And we treat side effects of medications with medications and uh, this creates great risk for the elderly. Uh, they have a tremendous altered perception of their environment. Uh, taste diminishes and therefore appetite diminishes. Uh, there are visual problems, they have difficulty hearing, etc., and that makes them prone to uh, accidents. Uh, and in particular, makes them prone to falls and uh, prone to weight loss and other uh, complications. And of course, in this population, we're dealing with uh, insidiously progressive dementia. And dementia typically is not a smooth progression. It can be variable and it can even be stepwise depending upon the actual type of dementia that the patient has. And while we focus on the memory component very often of dementia, uh, judgment is often impaired uh, and gait is very often impaired. Uh, and so it compounds the natural fall risk of aging. Um, and then if patients have a particular type of frontal lobe dementia, they can become very labile, uh, have poor impulse control, and become very, very difficult to manage. There can be uh, psychiatric manifesta manifestations, and uh, so you have to have a lot of flexibility and resource application. So a constant evaluation of risk is important as patients uh, develop progressive dementia, uh, risk of wandering, risk of falls, uh, risk of um, uh, self-harm, and of course risk of various acting out behaviors. And so that we've seen, as you know, the development more and more of dementia units, which are uniquely designed to um, uh, mitigate these factors in terms of risk and add to safety and management, but in doing so, uh, also very often can limit uh, some of the goals that you might have for independence and, uh, and flexibility. So it's always a very tough call which of these patients require a dementia unit and which of these patients are better served in a more independent environment. And as Dr. Moser just explained, uh, the fact that they are, these residents are prone to accidents, prone to falls, prone to changes in judgment that may cause uh, some sort of injury. Uh, the plaintiff's lawyers have found that whether it's personal care, assisted living, or in a skilled nursing environment, or even in a dementia unit, uh, they've learned that they can exploit that natural aging process. They can exploit um, those accidents and falls that happen to everyone because now that resident is in a facility and they'll claim that the fall was the result of some sort of negligence on behalf of the facility. And what they've done is they really have tried to promote an unfair strict liability standard. And what that means is in, in medical negligence cases, it's not a strict liability standard, meaning just because someone was harmed or an accident happened does not by itself, by definition, mean that there was negligence. They have to prove legally that there was a breach in the standard of care um, and in whatever licensed facility they're in, they need to prove that it was a breach within that particular type of unit. It was not standard within personal care or not standard within a skilled nursing unit. But the plaintiff's lawyers don't want to follow that. They want to say, look, someone got hurt, someone must be responsible, uh, that must be medical negligence. But that's simply not true, and, and it's not true legally. But the way that the plaintiff's bar treats that uh, treats these types of cases, you would, you would think that it is. Now, historically, most of these types of senior care litigation cases uh, were occurring more often in the skilled nursing units or the rehab units. Um, but what we're seeing more and more of is these types of lawsuits being filed against personal care homes and assisted living uh, facilities. This is on the rise. And almost universally in these cases, the claims are the same. And what's happening is that the plaintiff's lawyers are trying to exploit the risk that comes inherent with the greater independence and self-reliance uh, that's 
embedded in living within a personal care unit or assisted living facility. And so what we're seeing is that they try to ignore the benefits that come from living more independently in a personal care home or assisted living. And when an adverse event occurs, they just take the position that that particular environment, be it personal care or assisted living, wasn't appropriate. That the, the resident should have been in a higher level of care, whether it's a, a locked dementia unit, as Dr. Moser mentioned, or even a nursing, uh, skilled nursing unit, that they should have been getting more supervision, more clinical assistance, uh, or they should have been in a locked unit where they can't then leave the facility. And, and that's really the argument they make. And, and candidly, it's an easy argument to make because they're getting the case years later now and, and the harm has occurred. And unfortunately, when a fall occurs in this population, um, oftentimes that can lead to a deterioration and sometimes the death of the resident. And so they will file a wrongful death case and say, look, the, the, the resident was harmed, they got hurt, they may have passed away. Um, obviously, because a harm occurred, the level of care wasn't appropriate. And it, it's an entirely retrospective argument, but again, it is an easy one for them to make. And even though the burden is on the plaintiff, in some ways it feels like in these cases it becomes the defense's burden to try to prove that the, the level of care was appropriate. And it's a challenge. Now, what do we hear from the plaintiffs in these types of cases at deposition or at trial? It, it, it's, again, it's almost always the same. And it, maybe it's that they're being coached by their lawyers. Maybe it's just that this is what they really think and feel. But the, the responses that we get from the plaintiffs when we take their depositions with respect to an injury that occurs in a personal care home or assisted living is typically these three things, right? I trusted the facility to keep mom and dad safe, right? I put my trust in them. Um, they always will say, I relied on the facility to place mom and dad in whatever was the appropriate level of care. That wasn't up to me, what do I know, right? I'm not a clinical person, I'm not a medical provider, that's the facility's job. And, and, and they will say they are the experts, which is actually true. No, none of that is necessarily untrue. And again, from a defense perspective as the defense attorney in the case, it's very hard without the right evidence in place to be able to impeach those statements or prove otherwise. Because a lot of this has to do with what was in their mental state at the time. And often, what we get into in these cases is there is not evidence, uh, documentary evidence, or even the testimony of someone at the facility who remembers the admission well enough to be able to dispute these types of statements. And they're somewhat compelling. I mean, a jury could listen to that and say, well, that's true. It is up to the facility to determine what's the appropriate level of care. It is up to the facility to determine whether the resident's needs are being met and whether they should be transferred out to a different level of care or ever transferred in. What we also see is that the plaintiffs will either, whether they, they make it up or it's true, that they're just confused about what is personal care, what is assisted living, what are the services that are provided in a personal care home, and what is not provided. And again, candidly, that's because it is confusing. It's confusing for a lot of people, even some medical providers who just aren't that familiar with a continuum of care environment, who don't understand that even personal care and assisted living in Pennsylvania have different licenses. Not to mention what's the difference between personal care and skilled nursing. It, it is confusing and you can imagine for someone who's a family member or a POA who maybe has gone through the, the trauma of losing mom or dad in an unfortunate way because of, of, of a fall and then they are through the process now of being in a plaintiff's attorney's office and having signed that retainer agreement um, it can be very hard for them to try to 
really understand now, years later, maybe after the admission, what was I agreeing to when I put mom into personal care, or what did mom agree to when she signed that personal care agreement, which is obviously more common in the personal care setting than it might be in skilled nursing. The truth is, to the average juror in these types of cases, personal care and assisted living is a nursing home. Now, we know legally that's not true. Factually, it's not true. But again, in these cases, it's up to the defense uh, to be able to really explain that to the jury and really educate them on uh, what a personal care home is, and, is and, and what it isn't. Now, we're sure that most of the, the individuals out there listening to this presentation at your various facilities are probably already having these types of conversations with either the resident, the family, the POA, at the time of the resident being admitted to the personal care home or assisted living. You know, we are sure that you're probably talking about what are the services that are actually provided in the personal care home and what services aren't provided. And I'm sure you're talking about the differences uh, between dementia, a locked dementia unit, personal care, and skilled nursing. The problem is that once the lawyer gets involved on behalf of the family, the family or POA will quickly forget uh, that they wanted mom and dad in personal care for a reason. And so all the, all the good things behind personal care, uh, that you're getting assistance with activities of daily living, but you're maintaining a higher quality of life, that they are literally by regulation maintaining maximum independence and self-determination or whether it's for financial reasons, that the personal care unit is less expensive, those reasons will quickly be forgotten. And I assure you, if they're brought up at the deposition, they likely will be disputed by the plaintiff as having had any basis for the decision to be admitted into the personal care home. So what we see in these types of cases is because there isn't the type of economic damages that you might have in the acute care setting where there's either future medical plans or damages based on lost wages. And because the plaintiff's bar always chooses to pursue punitive damages in these cases, we see that senior care litigation, even more so than other types of litigation, is really driven by a few key emotional themes. The first is the idea of putting profits over people. Now, most of the members of Leading Age are coming from nonprofit facilities, and you may think that's not applicable to me, but I will assure you those same themes will be part of the case, whether it's for profit or nonprofit. They still will become involved that somehow someone is maybe making a, more, a larger salary as opposed to a bonus because uh, there was a mismanagement in the funds, even if the facility is nonprofit versus uh, for profit. They also use the fact that this is the most vulnerable population and that we have to protect them. And all these cases are always about safety as being the biggest concern, the most important concern. And they use the fact that the population is more vulnerable and older and fragile to their advantage. And they use it to invoke emotion and sympathy to get jurors behind their cases. What the plaintiff's lawyers will try to do is they really try to diminish the importance of the, in, the independence and the resident integrity that comes from that independence in the personal care setting and just focus on safety. Because it just is really about safety as opposed to these other things because those truly can be defenses in these cases. Now, you may be thinking about the fact that, well, look, when we're letting people into the personal care setting, um, you know, we're, we're complying with the regulations. Uh, we're getting all of the documents signed that we need to get. And one of those is going to be documentation of medical evaluation, or the DME. And you may be thinking, well, doesn't that give me some protection? 
that when someone's admitted into the personal care home, I have this DME that says a physician has agreed that this person should be or is appropriate to be led into the personal care home. The truth is, what we've seen in these cases is that that DMA only goes so far to kind of reduce liability or defend the facility. And there's some reasons behind that. The one is that there's always a question as to who was the physician or medical provider that performed the medical evaluation certification, right? Was this a doctor who's actually credentialed by our facility who may also act as a medical director? Uh, someone who we trust and know and can talk to easily about the medical evaluation or the resident or changes in the resident's condition? Or was it just someone outside the, the resident's um, PCP who we don't really know or have a relationship with and maybe we call them and we can't get them on the phone? Um, and that causes different challenges to the veracity of that DME. There's also parts of that DME that actually can be filled out also by the facility, not just the individual doctor. And so, again, then it becomes a challenge as to, well, who really filled this out? Uh, we know the doctor did the certification, but did he fill out all of the details with respect to the comorbidities and history? And then the last question is, well, what is the physician really certifying? If, if you look at just a standard DME, I will say in the cases that I've worked on, what the what the medical provider is certifying at the bottom of that DME, it really is just that the above named resident requires assistance or supervision with activities of daily living consistent with rule 2600. That form doesn't specifically state that this person is not appropriate for services in a skilled nursing or long-term care facility, which is what the regulation says. So I think a good plaintiff's lawyer could kind of parse that out and say, well, that's not really what they were saying. That still leaves a question as to whether the long, whether this resident was appropriate. Uh, or lastly, what happens a lot is that these are long-term residents. They're, they're sometimes in your facility for months, years. And so conditions can change. Uh, and sometimes that can happen very quickly. Someone's in a new environment, they're coming from home. Um, it can have a, a big impact on their mentation, they don't do as well, or sometimes those changes in their mentation or physical condition are subtle, slowly over time, and really only easy to see in retrospect, maybe after uh, an accident has happened, and a crafty plaintiff's lawyer will say, well, you should have known because of A, B, C, D. Ultimately, it's up to the facility to be responsible for meeting the needs of the resident. Uh, it's not the physician who certified the medical evaluation. Um, these ASPs, the assessment support plans, they have to be signed by the facility administrator or staff certifying that the resident's needs can be met by the ASP. And so what happens at the end of the day is that when there's an adverse event, this leaves the facility as the primary target as opposed to uh, the doctor who signed the DME. And what we see in these types of cases, the common theme is that the ASP must not have met the resident's needs because a resident was harmed. And the types of harms that we see most often in personal care and assisted living lawsuits are usually falls, we see elopements, sometimes we see skin integrity issues, but that really is less common given the population in, in personal care and assisted living. Uh, but, but often it is just the falls and elopements that are becoming really problematic because this population is more mobile um, and that's part of the why they are living in personal care or assisted living as opposed to a higher level of care. What you can do and should do is encourage the resident or the designated person, the POA or the family member to participate in the development of the ASP and whether they participate or not, document the extent of participation. Because if there is a problem later and there's a lawsuit, the fact that you have documentation that they were aware of what was going into the ASP and agreed with it, or that they chose not to be involved in that process uh, will be helpful evidence. Now, 
the unfortunate truth in these cases is that regulatory compliance doesn't provide any guarantees against adverse events or claims. And my, and my clients get really upset about that. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do by regulation. I've got all the right documents in place. Something happened and now I've got sued no matter, no matter what, even though I followed all the regulations. And that's the unfortunate truth in these cases. Part of the issue though in defending these cases is that the standard agreements that you have to have by regulation to be in compliance don't address the essence as to why the family member or the resident chose to be in the personal care unit in the first place, right? They don't address the why. They don't address that mom or dad was admitted into the personal care home to get the assistance that he or she needed in an environment that importantly, maintain their maximum independence and self-determination. That really, that concept doesn't show up in the standard agreements or documents that you need to have by regulation. In other words, mm -hmm. these documents don't address the risk that the resident, the family, or the POA agreed to upon admission that comes with living more independently and having more self-determination and autonomy over the way you're going to live in a personal care or assisted living setting. This puts facilities at a disadvantage in these types of litigation. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are ways that we can involve the resident family or POA so that they are part of the engagement and they share in the power and responsibility of the personal care admission. So I'm going to pass it to Dr. Moser to talk more about this kind of concept, which is not a new concept. It's been, a while, been around for a long time, hasn't it, Dr. Moser? It has been around uh, as, as long as we've been taking care of, uh, of the elderly. It uh, does not take a very long time of working in this space to come to a clear understanding that family dynamics are uh, powerful, uh, chaotic, and fraught with uh, past history and complexity. Uh, as Colin mentioned before, there's a lot of guilt involved, not only in having your loved one uh, go into a facility, but also guilt as to how your past relationship with that individual was. And uh, therefore, uh, communication really becomes uh, paramount when uh, you are trying to explain and be sure that the entire family system uh, understands this balance between uh, independence, empowerment, and the attendant risks. Uh, this has to be ingrained right up front in the admission process and then needs to be reinforced as the uh, individual is cared for in your facility. I think part of the dilemma when it comes to dealing with family uh, comes to two points. One is that very often we're only talking to one person in the family who might be the POA or might be the spouse. Yet the dysfunction or the guilt uh, is in another member of the family who becomes uh, more assertive uh, after the event and leads to the lawsuit. So ensuring that your communication with the individual who is representing uh, your client and assuring that they are communicating back to the rest of the family is really, really important. But the most key is starting on day one. On day one, this has to be identified and then reinforced and the risks articulated over time as the patient's uh, condition involved. And then all of that communication needs to be documented so that you have a clear record of the engagement of the family, uh, engagement of the resident, the uh, clarity with which you are sure that the resident is able to make those decisions, and then the, uh, or the POA, uh, and if you're dealing with one individual in a larger family, uh, gaining confidence and documenting your knowledge that that is being communicated to the rest of the family. And this has to go way beyond 
uh, simple compliance with regulations. This has to be, uh, in my mind, considered uh, job one and prioritized for the facility if you're going to protect yourself against uh, the inevitable. Families do not understand uh, these changes in condition and very often because they are not particularly sophisticated in healthcare um, have a particular issue understanding that balance between risk and independence and as well have a difficult time understanding the fact that sometimes that fall or sometimes that event is a terminal event in the course of the patient's dementia or decline. Uh, as we know, very often as patients' dementia progresses, uh, they become less safe and the risk equation continues going up. But for the quality of life, the independence also becomes more important. And if that's not explained upfront and continuously, um, it's going to be very difficult uh, to defend uh, an accusation when the patient has had a terminal event. And the documentation that Dr. Moser is talking about um, is really important when you're sitting in my seat as a defense attorney because documentation really means it's evidence in a potential lawsuit. And uh, they teach this sometimes, I think, in medical school. I know most of the nurses that I work with will, will tell me this, that if it's not documented, uh, it hasn't been done. Now, that's, that's not true. Obviously, we document often by exception. Uh, but it is important in a lawsuit to have the right documentation in place. And if you, you know, the, the, why is that? That's because memories do fade with time. Um, and admission staff or your clinical staff can turn over. People just don't remember things. The people that were there for certain conversations where maybe the, that balance of risk and independence was explained are no longer there. Or people have forgotten. And so they'll testify to their standard practice that they would talk about these things, but they can't say with any specificity whether they did so with this particular plaintiff or plaintiff's family. And it's just less persuasive evidence if you don't have documentation uh, to back that up. But you can create that documentation, and that's what Dr. Moser is referring to when he's saying you have to go beyond the compliance. There's no prohibition to having an additional document or record where you're kind of giving the family an informed consent. We do this all the time with other types of medical procedures, don't we, doctor? We do. We do. All surgical procedures, uh, pretty much anything we do. And people still go through with it almost all the time, right? Exactly. Yeah. We can create that type of document. We've done so for other clients, and if there's anyone out there who's listening who has an interest, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Moser or myself, and we can talk to you more about it, because we have these types of records that we've created for other facilities, but they really go through kind of an easy, simple, common sense documentation of the conversation the facility had to have had with the family about the balance of the risk versus independence. Because the, the family will likely say, absolutely, that's, the, that's what I want for my mom or dad. I want them to have that independence. I want them to maintain it for as long as possible. But I assure you that if there's a lawsuit after they've sat down with their lawyers, even if that was their opinion and their feelings at the time of the admission, or maybe even as years went by and they continued to be a resident of the personal care facility, once there's a lawsuit, they will quickly forget that. But if you have something like this, actual documentary evidence of this conversation signed by them, where they have agreed that this is what they want, you can show them that at a deposition. It will be compelling. It will change the narrative. It will change the defense for your facility, no question whatsoever. The problem is we're almost always in cases where we don't have that documentation. We're stuck with just the, the documents to comply with the regulations, and they don't cover this. So create the better, better evidence. It's that easy. Your, all of your facilities can do it. Really what an informed consent is, It's it's really proof of the conversation, of the education, of the engagement, of the empowerment that the resident and family has gone through. It's obviously not a free pass on liability here. You, you still have to meet the resident's needs, but it's a, another piece of helpful evidence to help dissuade a lawyer or defend a case when you can't dissuade them from pursuing it. It can be used at the deposition to rebut 
the evidence, especially maybe after a plaintiff is already on the record said, none of that happened. And then you can show them the document where they went through this with the facility and signed and agreed that this is what they wanted for mom and dad. Another thing that you can do on admission is trying to get some more protections from that medical evaluation that we talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, the truth is, and I think Dr. Moser talked about this, people who live in personal care units and assisted living, it's, it's a wide spectrum of residents with different types of uh, physical and mental conditions, different uh, degrees of dementia. Um, it's really those who do not require the services in or of a licensed long-term care facility. That's what the regulation says. But what does that resident really look like? Um, there's no bright line rule. And it really, the admission and their continued residence in the personal care or assisted living facility is based on the medical discretion or medical judgment of the providers that see them uh, sometimes on you know, a monthly basis if it's their doctor or sometimes on a daily basis if it's their nurses. Um, and as Dr. Moser, you and I were talking before, uh, just because someone's admitted with a certain condition, that doesn't mean they don't change uh, over months and years while they're living there, right? That's, that's correct. And so um, that evaluation, that medical evaluation of the suitability for uh, assisted living or personal care has to be refreshed and updated from time to time uh, any time that, that you note that the patient's condition is changing. And so what you can do for your facility is use that DME. Again, this, the documentation itself is to comply with the regulation, but your facility can supplement. You can call that physician if you have questions. And if you do about the have questions for that doctor who signed the DME, um, about whether the resident is appropriate or you need more information, document the call or the meeting. Make note of what was said. Make note that the doctor was in agreement for these reasons. Uh, it will become evidence later if there is an issue and it will be very helpful evidence. Um, these same rules apply not just for admissions but as Dr. Moser said, you, when you're doing annual evaluations uh, or if there's an evaluation because of a change in condition, call the doctor and then document uh, what the doctor said if you have questions. More often than not, the certifying provider who signs a DME is not a party to the lawsuit. And so if you have the right evidence, you can use that DME, which is a non-party verification of your facility's pre-admission screening and assessment as helpful evidence. You can use it as a shield. And the way the argument works in front of the jury is that this lawyer is just going after the facility. But if the doctor, who's not a party to the case, agree that the admission was appropriate, are, why are they going after the facility? It's because they want to pick on the nursing facility rather than actually go up against the doctor. Because logically, you can't seem to have a case against one party and not both if both parties thought the admission was appropriate. So you can really use it, but sometimes you need that additional supplement of that conversation with the doctor in your nursing notes where it shows that that doctor is on board for these reasons as to why that person was appropriate to be admitted into the personal care facility or to continue to reside there. Quickly, I just want to go over this. Um, obviously, the regulations, whether it's personal care or assisted living, require a signed admissions contract. I work with some clients. They interpret that uh, those regulations to mean that the resident has to sign regardless. Um, I will say this, we have been in cases before where a resident only has signed those admission agreements and often those admission agreements include an arbitration clause. And then the resident who maybe had a little bit of dementia on admission, that dementia continues to deteriorate and become worse. Um, and then so then when the, the lawsuit occurs, the plaintiff's firm will challenge whether that resident really ever had capacity to sign it. And so what I would say, just as a warning, something to consider for your admissions team, is that with personal care or assisted living, if you're going to have the resident sign and they are accompanied by family or POA who has the right to sign, think about having both parties sign. Uh, because then it's harder for the plaintiffs to challenge 
the arbitration clause uh, and the, the argument on capacity becomes a lot harder for them to pursue. And it's really not that hard of a thing for your admissions team to do to have, to have everybody sign that agreement. Dr. Moser, you, you, you talked about this before, um, but really they, they, the facility, they're in the driver's seat when it comes to the communication, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. It's the, uh, it's the most critical part of uh, risk mitigation for malpractice. Um, we know patients will fall. Uh, we know that um, things will happen in the course of a long-term stay. And what happens is that uh, the actual root cause when you look at the cases is that the claims are not necessarily caused by the poor care or any poor care, but that it's a lack of communication, that there's not a relationship between the um, family member who is leading the lawsuit and the, uh, and the facility, and that the documentation is simply not there and that the follow-up post-event has not been adequate. Uh, it is well shown in all types of uh, litig malpractice litigation that one of the best ways to prevent it is to have an open and honest discussion with the family post-event and uh, to um, apologize, not that the event happened, but apologize that they lost their, you know, express sorrow that they lost their loved one and be open and transparent about the event. And that transparency and that communication it really does start with the admissions process and it starts with having those conversations that are documented of the balance between the risk and independence and then every time that they have a point of contact with that family member or resident or POA that's an opportunity right that's right they have to continue to provide that five-star service create those relationships because that's really what it does come down to and it, it almost always can start with your admissions team and getting those few additional documents that can later be used if, unfortunately, a lawsuit can't be avoided um, and it, it goes into some sort of litigation process. You want to have those, those documents in place because that's the better evidence that will change the case. Because this is really what it's about in the end is you want to have the ability to kind of mitigate against risk in the first instance by using your best practices. When there is an event, you need to have the right reporting and disclosure as Dr. Moser just talked about. But when there's a claim, meaning before a lawsuit, but somebody is making a claim seeking money against your facility, it's important to have the right evidence in place. Because even before a lawsuit, there is often plenty of times to talk to that plaintiff's lawyer or the family about why they shouldn't pursue this. And again, things like that signed informed consent that the family was on board with the resident being in the personal care setting can be very powerful and can be an important reminder because maybe they forgot about that. They signed it years ago that they agreed that this was part of uh, the risk that they accepted because ultimately the independence that mom and dad got from living in that care setting was more important. And, and led to a higher quality of life, even if a fall happened, even if an accident occurred. The same is obviously true in a lawsuit, as we talked about, that we can use it at deposition, you can use it at trial, and it will change the case. But unless your facility develops those documents by just following those regulations, you, you probably won't have them. Uh, and it's really important to have them because it will make the difference because this is really what we want to show, right? These lawyers work on a contingency fee. If they don't get a settlement or a verdict in favor of the plaintiff, they get zero. And sometimes they get worse than zero because they've invested a bunch of money into the case that they no longer will be able to recoup. And so you want to have the right evidence in place, the right facts in place that can make a case look less attractive to the plaintiff's lawyer so that they don't take it or that they maybe will take it and go away for some sort of modest settlement. That's obviously the best case scenario uh, for your facility. So we went over a lot of material today. The, the unfortunate truth is that this has become uh, an area where the plaintiff's bar is becoming more and more interested and COVID-19 
has unfortunately not made it any easier. Um, there likely will be significant litigation now resulting from COVID cases and from just general other types of cases as more and more firms become interested in this space. Uh, we expect the plaintiffs will continue to try to take advantage of these personal care homes and assisted living facilities, but it simply doesn't need to be that way. With a few smart, innovative documents uh, that you can have on admission, uh, you can change it. You can really put yourself in, put your facility in a better position to be able to prove that the resident and family were part of the engagement process, that they wanted mom and dad in the personal care uh, facility. You can improve the effectiveness of your medical evaluation and generally create better evidence if a lawsuit can't be avoided. You have anything else, Dr. Moser? No, I think we'll be ready for questions. All right. Thank you. We're ready for questions.